Welcome to the Sierra Nevada Amateur Radio Society presentation for January 8th, 2022. We have a really amazing speaker and topic, and that is the USS Hornet Amateur Radio Club, November Bravo 6 Golf Charlie. And it's on the USS Hornet, <clears throat> which is a World War II aircraft carrier. Before I, I get started, let me introduce you to you, Jeff, a K6ERA. You want to say hi, Jeff? Hello, everybody. I'm Jeff, K6ERA, and I'm the current president of the USS Hornet Amateur Radio Club, or PARC. Come back to you in just a minute, and I also want to introduce to you Jim, one of our SNARS member, KJ7JXE, who was down on the USS Hornet in early November with uh, the, the scouts. Hey, Jim. How's it going? It was a great opportunity and uh, excited about uh, sharing some of the experiences we had. Great. And this is Barry K6ST. I had a chance to go down there and be with Jeff on the USS Hornet on the Friday after um, after uh, uh, Thanksgiving. So just a way before we get started, how did all this come about? Not just the presentation, but this introduction to the USS Hornet. I was on DMR, uh, well, I don't know, back in May or so, and I ran into Jeff. He was calling CQ from the USS Hornet from NB6GC. So we had a good conversation. One thing led to another. He told me of his Facebook group. He says, come and get hold of me. So I did. <clears throat> we had a couple of conversations. <clears throat> and then I put it in the back of my mind. And then in early November, I called Jim on a Friday, <clears throat> KJ6JXC, just to say hi. And uh, he says, hey, tomorrow I'm going down to the USS Hornet with the scouts. I said, well, I happen to run into... Uh, the president. So I put him together. Then he got, he was on, he was overnight on the ship and with the scouts and the cubs. And, uh, then, uh, then, uh, he and Jeff got together. And then since then I went down. So <clears throat> this is a, a great presentation that Jeff put together with some additional uh, side comments from Jim and myself about our experiences. So let's send it over to the, on the USS Hornet, which is located in uh, Alameda, California, near Oakland, overlooking uh, San Francisco. Let's send it down to uh, Jeff. Hey, Jeff, welcome. NB6GC from uh, K6ST with the Sierra Nevada Amateur Radio Society in the Reno Basin. Welcome. Hi, Barry. Thanks. And uh, good morning to everybody. Uh, it's great to be here. As I said before, my name's Jeff. Uh, my call is K6ERA. I'm president of the USS Hornet Amateur Radio Club. As Barry mentioned, we're located in Alameda, California at the old uh, Alameda Naval Base. And we're actually tied up at the pier that the uh, Doolittle Raiders left from uh, on their way to Tokyo. Um, we're at the exact same location they left from, only we're the Hornet that was uh, commissioned after that Hornet sunk. Um, let's go to uh, the club was founded in 2002, so this will be our 20th year. We uh, used the call sign NB6GC, November Bravo 6 Golf Charlie. And the reason why we used that call sign is when the ship was active in the Navy, our call sign was November Bravo Golf Charlie. So when we applied for a club license, we just put the six in the middle of it and uh, that's how we got our call sign and you'll find that a lot of other museum ships uh do that as well the iowa uses their original call sign and i think the pampanito the submarine in san francisco does um and, uh, and a bunch of other ships do the same thing so uh, that's why a lot of the ship's call signs are starting with n and then a letter a number and two other letters they tend to use their old uh, navy call sign so that's what we do uh, we're here to um, support and preserve the history of the USS Hornet, um, and we have quite a rich history, and I'll get to that in a little while with you guys. Um, our, our job pretty much on the ship here as the radio group is to promote amateur radio and uh, its importance in today's digital environment. Um, we maintain an operational station on the ship. And uh, we can, we, we're in a safe and stable location. In the event of a disaster or an emergency, we can get on the air. We have emergency uh, power on the ship. If power goes out, uh, we have emergency generators on board. The ship can be powered up and we can still get on the air. 
Um, and we also provide a fun environment on board the ship to uh, learn about amateur radio and uh, experience it in a historical uh, location. If any of you guys are history buffs, uh, you just can't be being on the Hornet and uh, operating the radio. And uh, while I'm on the air, I talk to a lot of, uh, I've actually talked to some even um, ex-Hornet crew me members, but a lot of Navy and military, and uh, it's a lot of fun. Um, so I've pretty much already described the, the role, but, um, and that's a picture of our HF radios there, and I'll talk to you about those later. But um, as a member of the club, and you don't have to be local to be a member, so theoretically you guys could join as well. Um, you don't have to be a volunteer. Um, most of us are volunteers, and the way it works on the ship, if you wanted to be a volunteer, you would attend, which is what's called new volunteer orientation. And that's given the first Saturday of every month. And what we do is pretty much what it says. We give people an orientation class on the ship. Um, they have to be able to tell guests where the heads or the bathrooms are, um, things like that. And uh, they have to know emergency procedures on board the ship and where people can go and where they can't go. So it's a little bit different on board than uh, than your, your regular station because um, we've got uh, quite a few decks and uh, quite a few places that aren't open to the public and you have to be able to know where you're allowed to go, where the public's allowed to go, of course, where the bathrooms are for people like that. Um, and it's also kind of a, a class for, uh, you know, they teach you things about uh, sexual harassment and things like that. If any of you work for a big corporation, you kind of know what those classes are like. And, that's what NVO is like. Then once you become a volunteer, you get a badge, which is uh, this guy here. And that'll allow you to come on board the ship pretty much whenever the ship's open and it'll also allow, to, allow you to stay overnight. Um, they do a background check on you because we do have quite a few scout groups and youth groups that spend weekends overnight. Um, and Jim will probably tell you about that because he was on one of those uh, youth trips. So. Uh, once you get the badge, you can just come sign in at the security desk and be on your way. If you don't have the badge and you're a radio club member, you just go to the security desk on board the ship, tell people that you're part of the radio group, and they'll either tell you to go up to the radio room or if you can't find it, which uh, it's very easy to get lost on the ship, they'll phone the radio room for you and you can come up here um, once you're a member of the club. Um, as a member of the club, you don't have to participate in the radio group only. There's quite a few other groups on board the ship. Um, there's docent groups, uh, like it says here, aircraft restoration, ship's restoration. The ship's always being worked on, paint being scraped, things are being repainted. And we also have quite a few education, uh, educational and liveaboard programs. And the liveaboard is like what I was talking about before, the uh, overnight groups. Um, we do encourage our members to get involved with uh, other ships activities. We've had members involved in the docent group. We've had other members involved in security on board the ship, uh, aircraft restoration. So the members do, the radio club members do do quite a few other things on board the ship. It's not a requirement, but it's, uh, it's open for you to do once you get on board and it's really fun and uh, really rewarding. And like I said, if you're a history buff, you just can't beat it. Um, speaking of history, that picture of the restored wildcat there, um, a little history on that plane. That plane, which is on our hangar deck right now, was recovered from the bottom of Lake Michigan in 1994. During World War II, the Great Lakes were used to train carrier pilots. So we had small carriers on the Great Lakes and they would learn how to take off and land on those carriers. Um, as a result, these guys were newer pilots, and there are quite a few of them that ended up on the bottom of the Great Lakes. So that, that wildcat there was actually recovered from the bottom of Lake Michigan. We got, the sh we got the aircraft on board the Hornet in 2006, and it took us five years to restore it. And it's finally uh, on display just as it rolled out of the factory uh, on, our on our hangar deck currently. Um, and we have a total of, uh, I think right now, 15, 15 uh, aircraft ranging all the way from World War II vintage up to the F-14, which was retired, I think, in the 
in the 90s. Um, F-14 is what was on Top Gun, if any of you are familiar with that movie. Um, so we do have 15 uh, historical aircraft on board that are restored, and we're still restoring others. So um, once you become a member of the club, uh, you can participate in all of our activities. We give a small uh, training course to members again. It's kind of like the NVO, but if you're not going to be a volunteer, we still want you to know where things are on the ship and uh, how to how to get around and uh, not get into trouble and go places you're not supposed to. Um, then once you're a, a member, you have use of the shack whenever the shack's open. We have several levers, levels of membership. We have uh, what are called station managers and they're people with keys to the shack and they know how to turn everything on and get everything running. And then we have associate members, which are just uh, our regular membership that can come on board whenever the station's open and operate the, uh, operate the ship station. Uh, we operate on quite a few, we do do quite a few special events over the course of the year. And I've got a few listed here. Um, we picked up Apollo 11 and 12. So we do have events for the recovery of Apollo 11 and 12. Apollo 11 was recovered in July of 1969 and Apollo 12 was recovered in November of 1969 but we're on for Veterans Day. We're on for what's called Museum Ships Weekend, which is, a, is an event the first weekend of June where all the museum ships around the world that have ham stations on them get on the air. And it's a two day event. It's not a contest, it's just an operating event. We all get on the air and work as many uh, stations as we can, as many modes as we can. Um, and that's a fun event. Um, we also get on for things like uh, do little raid anniversary, uh, field day. I'll have some pictures of that to show you how we do that. The Navy's birthday, uh, the Hornets commissioning day, and I've probably missed a couple. And that's one of our members there uh, in the picture, Gwen, uh, operating on Veterans Day, uh, either last year or the year before. It's been, we haven't had as many events recently because of COVID. And of course we're on a ship and there's a lot of cramped spaces, so we can't pack. <laughs> We can't pack the radio room like we used to. So, um, but we, we, we did manage to get on for quite a few events uh, this last year. And hopefully uh, things will get better for us and we'll be able to do a little bit more this year. Um, as far as what we're using for antennas, the Hornet is a uh, registered historical, national historical landmark. So we can't modify the ship. So we can't put up, um, commercial ham antennas. We did put up one VHF UHF antenna, but we can't put up big commercial HF antennas. Um, so we use the ship's original antennas. Um, when the ship was originally built, it had over a hundred different antennas on it. We only use a few of those. Um, and a couple of them are here in this picture. Up here, these twin whips are used on HF. They're at about 120 feet. And it's hard to see, but we have a fan dipole that strings from this yard arm up here down to right about here. And that's at about 60 feet at the bottom and 100 feet at the top. And then not shown on this picture, but a little bit forward, we use two of the ship's original verticals, which are right on the edge of the flight deck. And those are at 60 feet. Uh, we do have quite a good ground plane being on San Francisco Bay, and we seem to do fairly well with just 100 watts and the original ship's antennas. Um, when the ship was active, there were 13 radio rooms on board the ship. Some were just transmitter rooms. Some were just receiver rooms. Um, in fact, the ship's central radio room is right across from our compartment here. Um, we use those antennas and we've actually got a GoFundMe. We're trying to raise money to refurbish a few more antennas uh, so that we could use it. We have a disc cone that you can't see that we wanna be able to use. And we're gonna try and get some of the other wire antennas working. So that's an ongoing project. Um, and uh, working on the antennas is not always easy, especially when you get up near the top of the island and the other half of the fan dipole goes all the way up to the top of this mast. So we're gonna have to get a crane to get us up there. Uh, put the crane on the flight deck and then from the flight deck, get a bucket up to the top of the mast. Um, uh, there's no military requirements to join the club. Um, 
we do have a fair number of members that are ex-military, but I would say uh, probably 25%. So you don't need a military experience and to operate the station, all you need is a ham license. And if someone like me is around to be a control operator, as long as I'm watching you, if you have friends or children or whoever that you wanna get on the air and experience radio from the ship, uh, I have no problem putting people on the air from the ship as long as I'm uh, there to watch. And uh, any of you guys are welcome to come down and do that. And I'll give you my contact information near the end of the presentation. But uh, no military service required to be a volunteer or a member of the radio, uh, radio group. Um, as I was stating before, the ship has a pretty rich history. Um, the USS Hornet is an Essex class aircraft carrier. We were built in World War II, uh, commissioned in November of 1943. There were 24 Essex class aircraft carriers total built during World War II. Um, we have a displacement of 27,500 tons. The ship is 872 feet long and has a beam or width of 93 feet. Uh, we have eight boilers on the ship uh, that power four steam turbines that provide a, provided, they're not operational anymore, but they provided 150,000 shaft horsepower to four propellers. Um, so if you stood the ship on end, stood it on the stern, the top of the ship or the bow would be this, roughly the same height as the Empire State Building. Um, and we're roughly the same length as the Titanic was, uh, coincidentally. Uh, throughout its career, the Hornet went through several modifications. The picture you're seeing now is how the Hornet was originally built uh, as CV-12. And this is actually a World War II picture uh, of the ship. And uh, that's what it looked like uh, from uh, 1943 to 1945. It was briefly decommissioned and then it went through several modifications. The first one, uh, angled deck was put on the ship and a few other things. Uh, and then it became a attack aircraft carrier. So it changed from CV-12 to CV-812. And that's a picture of it in that configuration. And the final configuration of the ship, we were CVS-12. We were then commissioned as an anti-submarine aircraft carrier. And if you were to drive up to the ship today, it would look just like it looks in this picture. Um, the ship was decommissioned in 1970, and uh, pretty much nothing has been changed since then. So this is what the ship would look like if you were to drive up to it today in Alameda. Um, the ship was laid down in August of 1942, and an interesting fact was we were laid down as the USS Kearsarge. And then for, uh, I don't want to say morale reasons, the name was changed to USS Hornet to remember the USS Hornet that preceded us, CV-8, that carried the Doolittle Raiders. So if you were to go down to the keel of the ship right now, it wouldn't say USS Hornet. It says USS Kearsarge on the keel. They did finally commission the Kearsarge, but it was much later in the, in the Essex carrier line. Um, and I have that story right here in October of 1942, the CV-8 was sunk. So they named this ship uh, after that Hornet. Um, an unbelievable thing is that this ship was built in only 13 months. Um, and if you're on board the ship, you're gonna just be amazed at how that could be done. But we were really uh, cranking the ships out back then. So it took just a little over a year to build, a, build this ship. Um, from 1943 to 1945, we took part in 59 major battles with the Japanese uh, Naval and Air Forces, and the Hornet holds the record for most enemy aircraft destroyed in the air and on the ground by any uh, aircraft carrier in World War II. Um, in June 1945, the Hornet was uh, uh, got caught in one of Halsey's typhoons, Typhoon Cobra. And uh, what happened was a wave came up over the bow, the bow's 60 feet above the water line, or up over the flight deck, excuse me. The flight deck is 60 feet over the water line, and it crumpled about the first 50 feet of the flight deck. It just folded the flight deck down on the ship. Um, so that was one big wave. <laughs> and I'm glad I wasn't on board when that happened. 
Um, after that, the war was over for the Hornet because it was sent back to the United States for repair. Uh, when the war ended, the Hornet was just, uh, just finished with its repairs and it took part in what was called Operation Magic Carpet, which brought uh, soldiers and sailors back from the Pacific to the United States. Uh, after the war in 1947, we were decommissioned and placed in storage or a mothball fleet. Um, in 1953, we were recommissioned as an attack carrier, like I mentioned. In 1956, the angled flight deck was added. And in 1958, we were designated as an anti-submarine aircraft carrier. At this point in time, there were bigger carriers and uh, the Essex was considered one of the smaller carriers. Um, 1960 through 1970, we actually did several tours off the coast of Vietnam uh, on Yankee Station. Um, North Vietnamese didn't have a lot of submarines, so I'm not sure that we had a lot of uh, activity, but we did participate in the Vietnam War. And uh, one of the things that the Hornet's best known for is we picked up the Apollo 11 astronauts, the first men on the moon. Um, and we do have quite a few displays on the hangar deck. Uh, we have an actual Apollo quarantine trailer. I think it's the trailer from Apollo 14. We have a boilerplate Apollo uh, capsule that was used for testing whether or not the uh, capsule could land back on Earth instead of in the water. So there are quite a few uh, space artifacts on board the ship. And then after that, we picked up Apollo 12 crew which was an uh, all Navy crew. And shortly after that, uh, the Hornet was decommissioned and placed in reserve. And in 1989, we were stricken from the records. And uh, 1991, we became a National Historic Landmark. And in 95, uh, we got saved. We were getting ready, to, this ship was being ready to uh, be sent to the dismantlers. And we got rescued uh, from them and uh, the, Aircraft Carrier Hornet Foundation was started to preserve the ship as a museum. And in 98, we were officially opened as a museum. So we've been here since 98. And like I said, the club's been here since 2002. And we're located at Pier 2 at Naval Air Station Alameda, uh, as Barry said, in the Bay Area. Hey, Jeff, um, before, you, before you go on, just give that 30 seconds on how you got involved with it. Groupon thing. I think that's pretty interesting. Oh, how I did. Um, my fiance knows that I'm a big uh, history buff and she saw a Groupon coupon for the Hornet and I'd never been on it before. And this was about seven years ago now. And she asked me if I wanted to go to the Hornet and with knowing the answer was yes. Uh, so we came up here and I spent all day on the ship. Uh, the radio room wasn't open at the time, but I knew that there was a ham station on board. So when I got home from the trip uh, on board the ship, I looked up the ham club and found out who I needed to talk to and went to a meeting and joined on the spot. And uh, my fiance regrets it ever since because I probably spend more time up here now than on the weekends than I do with her. But uh, she knows where I am and I'm not getting into trouble. So that's a good thing. And you're about an hour drive away. so It's, it's about an hour. I live in Los Altos, which is just north of San Jose. So uh, it takes me about an hour to get up here uh, if there's no traffic. If there is traffic, then uh, <laughs> the commute time could double possibly. So um, I'm not going to go through all these campaign ribbons, but you can see the ribbons that the ship won uh, throughout its career. Um, like I said, we've got quite a rich history on the Hornet and um, all the volunteers are pretty proud of the ship. Um, and we love having guests on board and showing them everything that we, uh, we have on board the ship. Um, this is a picture of CIC and this is my cue to let uh, Jim tell you about what he saw and did on the ship when he came down with uh, his scout group. Yeah, thanks Jeff. Uh, so I had the opportunity to come out with uh, our scout troop, uh, Troop 443 out here in Spanish Springs. Uh, we had an overnighter there, and uh, it's, it's really a great experience for, for both the scouts and, and any of the leaders. I was, I was stoked to be able to go. I, I'm, I, I love history as well, and, and this was really an eye-opener, getting to uh, spend time on the ship and, and actually have an overnighter on the ship. 
but the CIC room is included in that overnight tour and and this was really cool. I mean, you go in here and you feel like you're in the hunt for red October or something like that. You know, it, it's dark, but there's red and green lights everywhere. And the CIC or Combat Information Center uh, kind of acted as the heart or brains of the ship while at sea. It was manned 24 seven and they monitored everything in the air, everything on the ocean surface and everything below from that one room and from what I understand it got pretty warm in there you had all kinds of equipment with the uh, tubes and and uh, just uh, quite a few people packed in there to make that uh, room do what it needed to do but they sent all the information from sonar and radar and sonar buoys through a data link and then that information was kind of parsed down by the um, ASCAC team and then it was fed into these plotters that have mechanical computers that's taken in telemetry data from what the ship is doing. It's taking all that radar data, uh, sonar data, and putting together a, you know, a little light on a plot grid as far as what's going, what the current situation is with the ship and with the ships around it. And then that was then conveyed onto these uh, information boards where guys would be writing backwards from the other side of the glass um, as far as what the current situation is so that the uh, CIC supervisors could have, you know, an at-a-glance look at everything that's going on and make decisions about navigation and combat operations. So that was just really cool to be able to check this out. And uh, the scouts loved it. Um, I, like I said, I had a great time. And uh, it's, it's, it is a little eerie being on a ship that big, you know, spending the night in, in uh, four high bunks um <laughs> but uh it was it was also just a great time so i highly recommend if anybody ever gets a chance to do an overnight group there um it, it's definitely well worth it and I'll, I'll turn it back to you that's that's about what i had on it okay great thanks uh jim you probably described cic better than better than i could have uh, so, <laughs> well, that's good to know. <laughs> I was worried I like bringing, about that. I like bringing people in there, but the, it's almost like sensory overload when you go in there. At first, there's so much stuff to look at. And like Jim said, uh, everything's uh, dark with blue lights uh, lighting the place. It's a really neat part of the ship. Um, we have other events, like I said, on board. This was our, uh, this was our 50th anniversary for uh, Apollo 11 splashdown. So um, we had a big event, a lot of people came and that's just, um, I took that picture down from uh, the deck I'm on here pretty much down onto the hangar deck when that was going on. And you could actually see the uh, Apollo 14 quarantine trailer in the background there. And the Sea King helicopter in the front here is what picked up the Apollo 11 astronauts. And it's actually painted to resemble the actual helicopter that did pick those guys up. Um, and um, we actually had a ham come visit uh, during this event who wanted to come up to the radio room and he came up and he was a former Hornet crew member and saw one of the radios we have in our radio room here and said, hey, that was one of my receivers that I used when we were doing the Apollo 11 recovery. So that was kind of cool. Took pictures of him and uh, uh, got a lot of press uh, for the radio club and for the ship uh, with uh, that visit by that ham from Southern California. Um, we do field day um, every year, except for the last two because of COVID. Uh, and we do it from the flight deck. So we set up, this is the only time the ship actually has a commercial ham antennas on it um, is when we do field day. We have a military tower that uh, we drag up to the flight deck and uh, put a tri-band beam on it and uh, string some inverted V uh, antennas off that as well. And those are our field day antennas. And we, you know, it depends on how many people are participating that year, but we usually have two to three transmitters. And uh, we put a little Honda generator in the catwalk off the flight deck. Uh, that powers our radios and uh, off we go. So this was us putting the antenna up uh, the Friday before uh, field day, Friday afternoon on the flight deck. And then these tents here are right in front of the island. 
and that's where we operate field day. We, I like to tell people we have one of the best views of uh, any field day site in the country. Um, looking out from the operating positions, we can see unobstructed across the bay. And then if you look towards the fantail or stern of the ship, there's the, it's pretty much a panoramic San Francisco skyline. Um, and that's inside one of the, uh, Inside one of the operating tents, you know, we just uh, uh, stay there uh, through the through the cold of night because uh, it does get kind of cold and foggy in the Bay Area in the summer, and uh, have a good time. We do have a berthing area on the ship for club members. It's a um, junior officer's bunk room, and it sleeps six. So it wasn't the uh, four high racks that Jim was talking about. They're actually beds. It's not the Ritz Carlton, but it's better than those racks. And uh, our birthing area sleeps uh, six club members. So we use that on events like field day and museum ship weekend when we're on uh, throughout the night. If somebody wants to crash, they can just go into the birthing area and catch a little sleep. So it's really nice to have that area on ship uh, for, us to, for us to use. And that's our area exclusively for the, for the radio group. Um, and that's what the uh, sunset looks like uh, during field day. You can kind of see San Francisco in the background there, and our beam is right here uh, in front of the island. Um, and this is our radio room. It's where I'm speaking to you from now. We have five HF operating positions. All can be used at the same time. Uh, the main radios are these radios right here. We have four Harris RF-350s, or uh, military designation was RT. 1446. They're 80s vintage. We wanted to stay kind of military theme. Uh, they're on more or less permanent loan to us from the Air Force. Um, so that's what we use on HF mainly. We do have one uh, ICOM, I think it's an IC7000 that we use on FT8. Um, but the main radios are these Harris RF 350s. And uh, that's what we use for HF. We now have bandpass filters up here above the rack where those scopes are. So we can get all the stations on the air at the same time. Uh, this is more of a general view of the radio room. Um, I'm actually sitting right here at this operating position. It's the operating position that Jim actually used uh, when he was on the ship. And when Barry was on the ship, he was actually right over here at this one. Um, but like I said, we have five operating positions um, and we sit down at an operating position on board the ship. That's, this is kind of what it looks like. Um, all the radios are computer controlled. We have a club member who designed software for these radios. So the radios are all on a rack and the control for the radios at every operating position uh, are on one of the monitors. And it's hard to see here, but this one has got the radio control on it. So everything we need for the radio, as far as changing frequency, changing mode, changing band, um, signal strength meter, SWR meter, RF output meter is all done with the computer. Um, audio is through this little box here. This is also a Harris box. Uh, you plug your headphones in here, you plug your keyer in here, um, and there's a little speaker here. And this is also a Harris box that's uh, same vintage as the transceivers. Uh, we have a little audio mixer for our microphones, and then we've got a CW here at every uh, operating position, and of course a computer there. Um, so when you sit down at an operating position, that's what you would see, and they're all exactly the same pretty much, uh, except for the FT8 station, which is the ICOM radio. So uh, when you're on the air, uh, that's, what it, that's what you're sitting in front of. Um, like I mentioned before, we do a lot of special events, and these are some of our special event QSLs, um, our Doolittle QSL, uh, QSL that we use for both the Apollo 11 and Apollo 12 splashdown, uh, the birthday of the U.S. Navy QSL, and the uh, Hornets commissioning uh, day, or as we like to call it here, the Hornets birthday uh, QSL, and that's a picture of the Hornet right after it was first commissioned there. Um, and that's all I have for you guys. Um, here's another nice picture of San Francisco in the background uh, during sunset. 
And uh, thanks for having me. I appreciate talking about the club and the ship to you guys. And like I said, we're all really proud of the ship and the club. And if any of you guys want to make a trip down, you can get a hold of me uh, either at the email on my QRZ page. My call is Kilo 6 Echo Radio Alpha. So my email is available there. Or you could find us on Facebook. I run the Facebook page. You could message us there. And all you got to do to find us on Facebook is just search uh, NB6GC. And our Facebook page will come up. There's a lot more pictures of things that we do. Uh, in the radio club on the ship and just a lot of other pictures of the ship and uh, stuff that you might enjoy looking at. So that's all I have for you. And I guess I'll turn it back to Barry. Uh, and I think he said there was Q, Q and A next, but uh, he's the moderator. So I'll let him uh, talk about what's next. Yeah, thank you. I just wanna to point to that picture uh, to the right of the plane here. Um, it's an amazing uh, view. We have some more pictures. I wanna show a short little piece here I'm gonna borrow your uh, screen share back here. Um, and I'm gonna bring up those other pic, those few pictures you sent me and then we'll stop and we'll, we'll do the, Q, the, Q, the Q&A here. So when I was on board, <clears throat> I was at that operating station here. Um, I take it you can see the, uh, the picture there, Jeff. Yeah. You shot of me. <clears throat> so uh, it's pretty cool. Um, this, the system is designed, I think designed uh, more to hold a frequency than to go up and down because there's no VFO dial. There's just um, an up and down arrows on the computer um, to change it. So I got on 20 meters and for whatever, this is in the afternoon. See, I got there about 12, maybe it was about 1.30 or so. And I operated from 1.30 to, or 2.30 to 4 or so, 4.30. Um, for whatever reason, I couldn't get on a 20, which was odd, but I went to 40 and it's really cool. It was not a contest weekend or not a contest that I was in. So I would just get on and say, hello, CQ, calling CQ. This is November Bravo Six Golf Charlie on the USS Hornet aircraft carrier. And then you get two, three, four guys come on. And so it's kind of, you know, you're working one guy after another, but you're talking about it and you're sharing it. And then if I don't know what to do, uh, they have a question, I turn around and say, hey, Jeff, what's the answer to this question about the history or the antenna or whatever? And then he and his, um, and his fiance were on another station over there. So a lot of fun um, on, uh, on on the bands there. I'll show just a couple more that Jim that Jim put together here. Um, once I, whoops. Um, this was a very, not Jim, but uh, Jeff. This is a very cool picture. Do you want to describe this, Jeff? Because I thought this was amazing. Yeah, was we amazing. actually had a event uh, several years ago to um, watch the lunar eclipse from the flight deck. And someone went up there and did a time lapse from the flight deck during that event. And that's what you're looking at. The stars moving. And uh, of course, there's some aircraft that flew through there as well. But that's our F-14 in the foreground. And of course, the island in the background. Uh, Obviously at night. That's yeah, that's a front on view from at night. And you can see San Francisco in the background. One thing you might just mention uh, briefly is about how the uh, you have the history because you do dose and stuff too, but tell them about how the front deck folded uh, years before. Yeah, when you look at it from the front here, you're saying, well, how could it be? It's all solid, so how could the deck fold? But during World War II, you could kind of see this line right here uh, on both sides of the ship. This was all open in the front, and there were guns uh, on the bow here, and this was an open area. So when the wave came up over the bow, it folded this flight deck up here down into that open area. Later on, when the ship was modified, it had put on to it what was called a hurricane bow, which is what you see now and everything's all enclosed. And all the Essex class carriers, uh, or most of them, were modified in that fashion after the war. I describe this as a very cool thing. This is the Hornet scoreboard. So this is what the Hornet did in World War II. All the engagements it was in, uh, plane shot down, ship sunk. Um, and this is on our hangar deck. So that's one of the things you see when you come up onto the hangar deck, which reminds you uh, of our history. So uh, like I said, it's really cool to be on the air from a ship and have all this history around you. I just want to mention uh, for a good slide, when I was on the air there for my two and a half or three hours, whatever, <clears throat> I'd have a lot of different people say, wow, didn't know about it. Wow, was on it once. Wow, never been on it, but I've been on this other ship or this other thing. So you get a lot of 
connection there. And then this is a very cool picture at uh, what looks like uh, dusk. That's actually in the morning. <laughs> really? Yeah. I took that in the morning. I usually get here uh, 6, 6.30, no matter what time of year. And uh, lots of times I can catch sunrise. So that was just before the sun started coming up. Uh, and I was standing toward of the island, obviously. And again, San Francisco's in the background. That's another picture in the morning. That's one of the aircraft on, uh, on the flight deck. That's a S3 Viking, which was an anti-submarine aircraft. That's a picture at sunset there. So that's the Hornet uh, at sunset again. Okay. Uh, before we end this portion, and we're going to go to Q and A here in a minute on a different on a different recording. Um, Jim or Jeff, do you have anything you? Uh, well, let's go to Jim first. Anything you want to say in closing? And I and anything and. Give us a little bit of the perspective from the kids that were on there. How many were on there and what, you know, the ages and how did, how did their eyes open up? Well, um, the first thing I, I did, uh, didn't add earlier that uh, was really cool was just the fact that uh, my son and I, we got there before the rest of the troop did um, because, uh, you know, thanks to your uh, in, uh, connecting me with Jeff. And then Jeff being awesome enough to say, hey, come on board, let's, let's get you on here, get you on the radio and give you a, a quick uh, inside tour. Uh, that was really cool because, you know, you get to see that inside, you know, the inner radio room uh, that's not normally on any of the tours. Uh, and, you know, he was showing me how the different lines coming in and out of some of the machines in there had, you know, were painted red, meaning that that was classified information. And so just, you know, getting a behind the scenes tour, getting to see the, the captain's uh, shore uh, room and uh, the admiral's room, that was all really great stuff to be able to see that. That's not on your normal tours there. Um, and then just being able to operate. I, I will admit that was before I had my general and, and uh, I even today, I'm still a little uh, uh, mic shy when it comes to HF. So um, working on that. But, uh, you know, especially uh, getting to operate, you know, on a HF before having my, my general, you know, under their call sign, that was a pretty cool experience. To, I made one contact and I said, oh, that's it. I'm good. <laughs> so hopefully next time I'm, I'm uh, uh, have a lot of the, those reservations behind me and, and uh, can uh, get in there and really actually have some fun. Uh, the scouts loved it. We were, like I said, we were with the troop. So most of them are going to be um age wise say 11 through uh, 15 16 and uh they i think we had about there were probably about 25 between 25 and 30 of us uh we weren't the smallest group but we weren't the biggest group either the biggest group we had a huge cub scout pack that was there and they were all setting up their tents in the hangar bay uh or hangar deck and that was really neat to see you know uh, 30 some, uh, tents inside this area and, and, you know, a full Cub Scout pack camp out taking up a very small portion of this ship's hangar section was just amazing. <laughs> and, and that's one thing that you will notice if you go there, your, your, uh, perceptions get kind of messed up because you see these planes and you know, these planes are big planes, but then they're inside of this this uh, hangar that is just so massive that they seem small. And so I think everywhere you go on the ship, you know, especially when you start going through some of those corridors down in the, in uh, on some of the other decks, um, it's, you know, you, there's no way, you know, there's very few windows, I should say. And your, your sense of, you know, proportions and, and things get all out of whack and, and uh, that is one thing about doing the night tours is they do have you got kind of going back and forth a little bit and it's very fast paced. I think we started at about seven o'clock and ended somewhere around 10, but you know, I, I couldn't tell you how many times I don't even know if we backtracked it all or at any point in time, or if they had it pretty well plotted out so that it was that we weren't backtracking, but it's a lot of high. I, I think I ended up recording something like uh, two miles of, of hoofing it on, on that tour <laughs> um, on my uh, 
smartwatch. So it's, it's pretty amazing how much, but it didn't feel like it. I should add that as well. You know, you're, you're, you're traveling a long distance kind of going back and forth on this ship, but you know, it, it's funny how it doesn't really feel like that. So your sense of proportions are, are really messed up while you're on the ship. But, uh, um, so it, it, uh, the other thing that was added to the eeriness of sleeping over there is, you know, it's got kind of an old ship smell. I understand that most of that's from the bunk oil that they, and I, I I don't, didn't really get a full understanding of what the bunk, I guess the, I, I don't know if that's some sort of a preservative or what, but um, it, fuel oil to power the. What's oh, that? Ship. It's fuel oil. Oh, it's the fuel oil. Okay. Sure. Well, anyways, it, uh, <laughs> it, it sticks to everything that you bring on board. So make sure you, you use a, uh, a pillow that <laughs> an old pillow, if you come aboard. So Anyways, uh, that, it was a great experience. The, the scouts really had it. It was really eye opening. You know, a lot of a lot of the scouts that we took, I wouldn't say were normally are normally all that much into history, but being submerged in history like that, um, uh, being on a ship like that, it, it it did open their eyes. And they they, you know, even a couple of the the scouts that I, I you know, from time to time, you know don't seem like they're listening. You know, when these, when these veterans, you know, were talking, they were dead silent and they were listening to everything they had to say and soaking it in. And it was great. And, and the, the docents are amazing. Um, the guy that showed our, us the CIC room, Keith, uh, I, I think he said he was on another Essex class ship, but I'm, I'm not certain on that. Um, or if he was on, actually on the Hornet, but, you know, he was talking about his experience first day in that CIC room, having to figure out how to write backwards and <laughs> just kind of thrown in at it, you know, without being expecting it. And uh, got, he said he got very good at it very quickly, actually. But, you know, great stories. Um, uh, one, of the, one of the guys was, I believe, actually one of the, the pilots that showed us the uh, pilot's ready room uh, or briefing room. Um, that, was, that was cool getting to hear a lot of his stories. Uh, his wife was a uh, nurse for several years. I don't know if she, I can't remember. I think she, I, I can't remember if she said she was in the military or not, but uh, you know, she had just a ton of history about the uh, med, med bay that there and uh, how it would have operated. And then seeing the torpedoes and, and having kind of a dissection one of the torpedoes to be able to see, that was cool. So just a lot of information and great stuff for, for both kids and adults in that place. It's, it was amazing. Great. Thanks, Jim, from that perspective. I'll say one or two things. We'll send it to Jeff, and then we'll stop this part of the recording. Um, so I, I had a slightly different experience than Jim. I was just out there for five hours. Um, I lost all sense of um, sensory perspective. Uh, I, I was not in the CIC ever, and that hangar deck... Uh, I just went through it for about five minutes on the way out. So that's something I would go see again. I was not on the standard tour that Jim got, well, standard tour, the night tour, but Jeff gave me a private tour. So I got to see a lot of cool stuff. Um, I, I lost track of where I was and I was with, I was with him the whole time. So this, you know, I, I was not in the military. I've never been on an aircraft carrier. I've been on the Pompanita, which is a small, older World War II, I think World War II, um, Yes, yeah. submarine. So I was overwhelmed in a good way, but I got pretty confused. Um, one thing I noticed after I left and I got back to uh, some family, I was exhausted. And I think, well, part of it was I drove down the day before, but I think it there is the, you know, the smells, the, the, the whole experience is amazing, amazing. Um, there were, so I didn't see the CIC and there's some things I didn't see, but Jeff took me on a private tour and I felt like uh, the thing that I want to say about Jeff, when I met him on the air the first time and ever since then, I feel like I'm a VIP. And I think that's just what Jeff does in the whole club. It was yeah, Jim's agreeing it pretty, pretty darn amazing. Last thing I want to say is, <clears> or <throat> two things. One is I grew up in the Bay area and then I moved away and I moved back. Um, and, um, uh, I'd never been on it. 
And uh, I have a cousin who has since passed on. He's a silent key. He was a ham. My dad got his ticket at age 80. And uh, my cousin Al, um, which would have been around my dad's age, um, got a ham ticket also. He's the, the father of my uh, cousin who got me the ham radio. But Al was on on this ship in World War II. Um, and then he came back later. He lived in Redwood City about 45 minutes away. And uh, he was a docent for a long time. Uh, in talking to some family members uh, recently, uh, he was either the chief mechanic or one of three main mechanics that um, had access to the whole ship. So at some point, I'll have to get together with my cousins and get a little bit of history. But it's it's quite it's quite amazing. Last thing I want to say is, being on the air on a great station is one thing. Being on the air on a great station that has such history and something to talk about is unbelievable. You know, you you, you could just chat and, you know, Jeff just puts you in the, in the station. What were you saying, Jeff, to me the other day when we were practicing or prepping, you, you said, just get somebody on the air and, and they, they just, they just do it. So that's bit was my experience. Let me send it back to Jeff and then we'll open up for Q and a on another recording here in a minute. Thank you so much, Jeff. What do you want to say in closing? Oh, uh, I mean, I agree with you guys. I've been here for seven years, and um, usually the decks that I'm on are uh, hangar deck and above. And if uh, if I'm uh, below the hangar deck, I get lost still after seven years. So, And I've talked to people on the air and tell them where our radio room's located, and they might have been a Essex-class crewman, and they're like, I have no idea where that was because they worked on another part of the ship. They never came up here. Um, but you guys, if any of you want to come down, contact me. I'll uh, drive up here and open up the station for you. Um, you can operate as long as the ship's open. Um, I, like they said, I have keys to the ship's uh, central radio room. I like giving people a tour of that because that's kind of the, uh, like CIC is the complete nerve center of the ship, the central radio room was the radio nerve center of the ship. And I can take you in there that's not normally open on tours and then on this deck that we're on i like to take people over to the uh the captain's quarters uh captain's import quarters and the admiral's quarters and show you their conference rooms and uh, how they lived on board the ship and that's all stuff that i have access to as well as of course the the ham station on board so uh, feel free to contact me like i said we're proud of our station here and we're proud of the ship, and we'd love to have you come down and visit. Um, I'll just mention that um, if you go, I have it in the, it's in the chat, the um, fa the Facebook page. It's it's basically facebook.com slash November Bravo 6 Golf Charlie, and uh, you can get a lot of information. You can contact him. If you have any questions, you can always contact me, k 6 Sierra Tango at ARRL.net. Last thing I want to say before we uh, stop this portion, and that is, um, uh, you know, we got COVID going on, so there's that how much, how many people can be together and overnight and all that. But uh, shy of that, whatever that looks like, uh, over time, maybe we can uh, Snarth can do something, and maybe it's with kids also. With uh, Jim is Jim uh, KJ Seven JXC is involved with the scouts, so. We'll have to see what happens. Maybe we can do uh, either a SNAR special uh, thing going down there, or maybe we can do something with kids and do a combination. Um, it's about a five, four and a half, four, four and a half, five hour drive, one direction down to uh, Alameda, Oakland. But that might be something we can do. So uh, we'll go from there. So with that, I'm gonna say uh, thank you, Jim. Thank you, Jeff for this amazing presentation. I'm gonna stop the recording and then we'll go to open Q&A. Thanks, Barry.